Great. So we are very glad to have Chelsea Walton, uh, pseudo virtually visiting from Rice, who's going to tell us about the representation theory of electric algebras. All right. Uh, thank you, Ravi, for inviting me to give a talk here. It's really well organized. Like I, I like the chat features and everything. And it seems like the audience is mostly not from Stanford. So it's really cool that you got such a wide audience. Um, yeah, if, there have any, if you have any questions along the way, really do feel free to interrupt. I, I hope to keep this really down to earth. So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, representation theory of elliptic algebras. Uh, this is joint work with my collaborators, Xin Ting Wang and Alan Yakimov. Um, and uh, of course, this is for the Stanford AG seminar. But the first thing you might be wondering is, all right, you know, she does non-commutative algebra rep theory. What does this have to do with AG? So let's just get that out of the way at the very beginning. What exactly, oh, why am I here? Well, I mean, broadly speaking, I think of algebra as a way of solving equations. It's basically the study of solving equations. If you want to solve the equation with, let's say, numbers, then you get a commutative algebra. And if you're interested in solving equations, let's say with uh, geometric methods, then you get, well, AG. But on the other hand, if you're interested in solving equations, let's say with uh, matrices, finding matrix solutions to equations, well, then you end up with um, non-commutativity, delving into non-commutative algebra. And the study of solving matrix equations or solving solutions with matrix equations, ah, solving equations with matrix solutions, um, really is representation theory in a nutshell, okay? So what I wanna do in this talk is basically use AG and maybe even Poisson geometry if I get a chance to do so, to study representations that of algebras that are pretty close to being commutative, but they're still non-commutative, okay? So that's the goal, use geometry to study representations of algebras close to being commutative. So, so right now I'm, I'm reading this as meaning that we can really see a lot of geometry, like get close to being commutative mean, means to me that I can still think quite geometrically. Uh, yes, yes, yes. There's gonna be a variety. There are even gonna be pictures later. <laughs> so you can still use uh, classical geometry, nothing too fancy. Now I, want, I really wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page here. Um, I want to tell you what I mean by algebra representation. What do I mean by studying representations? Just to make sure we're, we're all on the same page. By an algebra, I mean a C algebra. So what this is, is this is a ring that uh, also comes equipped with uh, the structure of a vector space in a compatible way. Um, most of the time, I'm going to work with infinite dimensional algebras. So algebras that are infinite dimensional as a vector space. So the main examples that you want to keep in mind are your polynomial algebras. And then later on, I'm going to take non-commutative versions of these gadgets here. Uh, by representation, what I mean is that if I'm given an algebra, okay, so an algebra over C, a representation is going to be a, a C vector space that comes equipped with an action, an action of A. So I can think of a representation as a module over A, or if you like, I can take the endomorphism uh, ring of the algebra that forms an algebra, and I want basically an algebra map going from A to this endomorphism ring. So this is where you start to see why representation theory is really about um, solving equations with matrices, because if you have an equation, um, and or if you have an algebra, that is defined by equations, then cooking up such a map gives you solutions to that equation here. Now, in this talk, I'm not gonna actually write down very explicit representations of algebras. What I'm most, mostly interested in are, um, let's say, if given an algebra, does it have a relation, does it have a representation of a certain size? That's gonna be called the degree or dimension of the algebra. And that is precisely the degree or the dimension of the underlying vector space V. All right. Now, I am not interested in taking any old representation. I wanna take what is pretty much like the building block of representation theory, your irreducible representations. So if you're given an algebra, 
we say that a representation is irreducible if basically you can't take the representation and shrink it down properly. There's no proper subspace, let's say W of V, so that the A action on W is stable, okay? Um, now, if we stay in this context and look at irreducible representations of commutative algebras, then they end up all being one dimensional. So in this sense, representation theory is really a non-commutative subject. Representations of commutative algebras in this sense are, are quite boring. They're just one dimensional here. All right, so are we all on the same page so far? Okay. All right. Now, what I wanna do, again, this is the goal. Uh, I wanna use algebra geometry, Poisson geometry, to study representations of algebras that are close to being commutative. Now, I need to define what I mean by close to being commutative here. What I mean is that I'm gonna have an algebra that's called a, a PI algebra. So I need to talk about what these, these algebras are. Uh, then I'm going to study representations of them in general using uh, techniques in algebra geometry. And then I'll apply those techniques to study uh, reps of PI elliptic algebras. So that's, that's the group plan, all right? Okay. So PI algebras. All right, I think these are pretty cool. So let's take an algebra and we say that it's going to satisfy so-called polynomial identity or is PI if there's some monic multilinear polynomial so that when you stick in any tuple of elements of the algebra, you satisfy this polynomial here. So let me give some examples. Mm, yeah, so for example, if I take a commutative algebra, then an example of a polynomial identity is just uh, this commutation relation here, all right? Now, the reason why PI algebras are the algebras that are so-called close to being commutative is because at least in the case where your PI algebra is nice for you theoretically, when the algebra is prime, that's a weaker condition than being a domain, you can measure how far your algebra is from being commutative via its PI degree. So the PI degree, what it is, is you take all the polynomial identities that you can cook up for your algebra, you take the one of minimal degree and take half of that degree. That's the PI degree of your algebra. So for commutative algebras, for instance, this is an example of an identity that has the smallest degree, has degree two. So commutative algebras are PI and they have PI degree one. All right. So, so the let me ask a couple of questions. So, so if A is prime, so prime is, so you said prime is like integral domain. If I parse that correctly, two nodes. A little bit, yeah, it's weaker. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I guess we could, well, uh, like any two non zero things multiply to something non zero. That's it, right? Or wait, are oh, you. This, saying, this condition are you, here. Are algebras having one? Not that this will. Do you algebras have one or not? Yeah, let's assume they have one, but by a prime, I mean that we have this condition here. So you're allowed to stick in elements in the middle, whereas for a domain, you want, of course, A times B is not equal to zero. Oh, because it's not, okay. I got to keep remembering I cannot commute. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, no, don't commute in this talk. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up here. Yes. All right. And then if, okay, so and I buy that if it's commutative, it's PI degree is one. But if it's, mm -hmm. but for example, if it's not commutative, I mean, if it's PI degree is one, there's no reason for it to be commutative or it, you, like, you could just have some crazy. So the fact that the PI degree is finite already is some super strong condition. It's yeah. in my mind. Uh, yeah. Uh, but then, oh, you're about to say, oh. Oh, I'm going to give lots of examples. Ah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. I get yeah. it. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. No problem. So like, for instance, if you have a matrix algebra, here's an example of a, a polynomial identity. It's called the standard identity. It's actually pretty hard to show that your matrix algebra satisfy this identity. It's actually easier to show that it satisfies, um, let's say S2D plus one. Okay, there's a theorem that show that your D by D matrix uh, algebra satisfies this uh, polynomial degree 2D. In any case, it works. And um, 
your matrix algebra is prime so that you end up getting that the PI degree of it is D. So basically, the larger your PI degree is of your algebra, the more non-commutative it is. And along the way, you have your matrix algebras at each step. I mean, you could, you could think of your three by three matrix algebra as being more non-commutative than your two by two one. Um, here's another example that's pretty interesting. So we can take um, a free algebra and instead of commuting the variables, just anti-commute. So that should be pretty close to being commutative. I'm not gonna write down what the polynomial identity is, but this algebra does have PI degree two. So it's just one step away from being commutative. So I, I, I have no idea. I, I feel like I should see that identity for the one above and say, oh yes, that's why it's true, which I don't. But given that, I feel like the trick for the next one is to try to get a two-dimensional, somehow write them X and Y as two-dimensional matrices. Uh, yeah, so the way to get PI, that, that's one way. You can take your algebra and embed it into matrices and write down the identity. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Here's another example or some other examples of PI algebras that are prime here. Uh, you could take a Lie algebra, take its universal enveloping algebra and quantize it at a so-called root of unity. I don't want to specify what that process is. You can also take quantized function algebras of a Lie group at a root of unity. These are examples of algebras that are close to being commutative. They have a large center. They have a large center. And in fact, they're measurably close to being commutative because they have a PI degree that explicitly depends on the order of Q. So these are nice examples of non-commutative algebras that are very close to being commutative. Now, one way that I like to think about PI algebras or one class of them is, all right, I have my commutative algebras, matrix algebras, you have your Q polynomial algebras where Q is a root of unity, as well as these other algebras that depend on a root of unity here. These are all prime PI algebras, but one large class of algebras that lie in this family are algebras that are module finite over their center. They're finitely generated as a Z or Z module. Okay, so in fact, all of these algebras belong to this class here. All right, so again, uh, PI algebras are nice. They're measurably close to being commutative. And the way you measure is by using the PI degree. You can also think of the PI degree squared as the rank in a very rough sense of um, A over the center. So for example, if I have a commutative algebra, its center is just A, all right, A is a, has rank one over the center here. If you have a matrix algebra and take its center, its center is small, okay, it's just C, all right? And its rank over C is just D squared. So this checks out. And then for this algebra, its center is pretty close to being this algebra on the nodes. The center is a polynomial ring in two variables where X and Y are now, um, well, they commute with everything. Now A as a module over Z has rank four, and indeed that is two squared. Okay, any questions? All right, now let's talk about representations. So remember, we're interested in studying irreducible representations, representations where mm, there's not a stable subspace under the A, the A action, nothing, nothing proper we can have. So for example, if I take A to be a commutative algebra, remember it has PI degree one. And if we're given an irreducible representation of it, well, we stated before that that has to be one dimensional or have degree one. So there's kind of a connection here between the PI degree and what the dimensions are allowed to be in a way. On the other hand, if we take a matrix algebra, its PI degree is D. And in this case, some of you know, if you take a simple module over a matrix algebra or take an irreducible representation of a matrix algebra, these 
all have the same dimension. They're given by columns of the matrix algebra. This is one of these algebras where any representation of it, if it's irreducible, it's gonna have degree equal to D. This is an example of a, an algebra that is so-called Azumaya, okay? An algebra that all of its irreducible representations have the same degree or same dimension. And again, there's a connection between a PI degree and what your dimensions are allowed to be. Okay, now let's take this algebra. This algebra has PI degree two. And in this case, this algebra has irreducible representations of dimension one and two. There's actually a, a, a theorem that describes what's going on here, why the dimensions of your representations are actually bounded by the PI degree. I'm going to attribute this theorem to a lot of people. Not a, <laughs> I'm going to add on to this theorem later and more people are going to get thrown in. So, okay, we have Artin, Brown, Gooderall, um, DiCaccini, Purchase, small bunch of people. But what the theorem says is that if you have a PI algebra and it's prime, and it also has other nice ring theoretic conditions like it's finally generated as an algebra, it's an ethereum, then you always get that any irreducible representation of it, it has to have dimension less than or equal to the PI degree of the algebra. So if you have a PI algebra, you have a finite PI degree and it's gonna bound the dimensions of all of its irreps. So at this point, this is a super strong case for why the notion of PI degree is a good notion. Yeah, it's, re it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to add to this theorem later. So that's why the thoughts are here. Okay, so now what I want to do is bring in some geometry because that's why we're, <laughs> we're all here. So let's suppose that I have an irreducible representation. I want to think of representations up to equivalence, okay, up to basically up to change of basis. So I'm going to denote the equivalence class like so. Now, my algebras are always going to be PI algebras. So you're going to have a large center. You're going to have a center that is measurably close to the algebra. So I want to take advantage of that. First of all, if I take the kernel of this irreducible representation, it's going to end up being a maximal ideal of A. And now what I want to do is I'm going to take that kernel and I'm going to intersect with the center. So I get a maximal ideal of the center, what's often referred to as a central character or a central character. These central characters all strung together, that's going to be the geometric object that's really going to rule the representation theory of A in the PI case. So putting this all together. So maybe let me ask a reality check question, which is mm -hmm. if you are the full matrix algebra, then mm -hmm. this is boring because there's only one. Is that right? And then, so when it's smaller then it's- we're, Yeah, you know, we're gonna get there. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like reality check questions. Okay, so here's the second part of the result. If you have, uh, your PI algebra, that's nice, prime, all these other nice conditions. Let's take the collection of all the equivalence classes of irreducible representations of it. We could take the kernel of the representation and then intersect with the center and get what's called a central character. And that's gonna be a point on this affine variety, max um, spec of the center of A. This assignment here is actually subjective and it's well-defined. So this is this gadget here is really gonna help us out in studying the collection of irreducible representations. Okay, so let's do some examples to make sure we're all on the same page. Let's take a commutative algebra again, right? Center is A. PI degree is Can you one. explain why it's a maximal ideal? Uh, sorry, could you explain why it's a maximal ideal? Why this has to belong to here? Yeah, why it's a, max, um, a maximal specifically. Why maximal? 
Oh, how do I get, give a quick answer? So you have that the kernel is maximal. Oh, there's an easy answer. I'm just forgetting how to explain it right now. I'm sorry. Okay. It is, it is a maximal ideal. Yeah. Okay. So let's go through an example. Are, are these, so you get a, right, if it's maximal, you get like complex numbers. So are these like characters of the era? Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to interpret what, how I should think of the image of number two, this well-defined trajectory map. These things feel character-like. Is that that's why, yeah, that's precisely why they're called central characters. Oh, they're called central. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe you said that a minute ago. No problem. Okay, so let's take a commutative algebra here. And if we were to collect all of its irreducible representations, remember they have to be one dimensional, so they all look like this, right? So, I mean, you just end up getting characters anyway. So, really, this is in one to one correspondence with max spec of A anyway. But if we were to use this assignment here, well, what do you get? Well, max spec of Z of A is max spec of A. And there's going to end up being a one-to-one -one correspondence between these characters and these kernels. In any case, so again, the commutative picture isn't really so illuminating. Okay, all of these sets, max spec of A, irrep of A, max spec of Z, all the same, or at least are in bijection. Let's take a different extreme. Let's take the matrix algebra that Robbie wanted to see. Okay, here the center is small. Your irreducible representations have to have dimension equal to D here. So your irreducible representations are really identified as isomorphisms between your algebra and your matrix algebra. The kernel here is zero. The kernel here is zero. So this ends up getting sent to zero over here. And, you know, as a sanity check, okay, what you do end up getting up here is max spec of C, which is zero as well. Okay, so commutative algebras, matrix algebras, this, this map that they cooked up up here seems to be working out. Okay, now let's get into something a little more uh, interesting. Okay, let's take a, this is a part piece by piece. So we have this algebra, it's close to being commutative. Instead of having variables that commute, you have the X and Y anti-commute. The center is just a polynomial ring of two variables generated by the squares of the generators. And as we stated before, you can have irreducible representations of degree one and two. So as promised, we're supposed to have a way of going from the collection of irreducible representations of A to max spec of Z. So, so can, can I, uh, okay, so there's gonna be a lot of them because you have the full plane, max spec Z is so, and so I should be able to name some, mm -hmm. uh, and I've not, okay, so what are, like you can like set X and Y equals zero and that's a one dimensional representation? Yeah, so yeah, we're gonna break this other... apart. We have the two dimensional ones. That's yeah. actually gonna be most of the representations. Yeah. And we're also going to have the one dimensional ones. So Here's some should examples. I, hmm? Should I see some off the top of my head? I, I, sure. what are, like, I don't see some yet. Uh, they're all here. Oh, you're, oh I see. You're, you're going to tell. Oh, I should just read. You're going to tell us in a second. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, great. They're all here. Yep. Great. Yeah. So you can set uh, y equal to zero and then x equal to anything and send x equal to zero, y equal to anything. And in fact, they're going to line up with the axes of C2. And by lineup, what do I mean? If I take an irreducible representation of degree one and take its kernel, so for example, this one here, the kernel is x minus alpha and y. Then what I want to do is intersect it with the center. And what this yields is this point down here. But there's a two to one map. We get that rho alpha maps to this point, and so does rho minus alpha. So there's a two to one correspondence. There's a two to one correspondence between uh, irreps of A and max spec of Z, at least when I'm working with one dimensional uh, representations of this type. 
We have similar correspondence for uh, working along the vertical axis, but at the origin, the only point that corresponds to the origin is the trivial representation. So that's the one dimensional stuff, all in purple. Is it true? I'm going to speculate that the one at the origin somehow is with multiplicity too. I feel like if there's a, mm -hmm. nope. nope, it just is honestly by himself. Yep. Okay. Because it, yeah, it just jumps. Mm -hmm. it, okay, cool. Yep. And then the two dimensional representations correspond in a one on one fashion with the stuff off of the axes. Okay. So what, what do I mean by correspond? I take a two dimensional irreducible representation, take its kernel, intersect with the center. You end up getting a central character down here or a point corresponding to an on axis point. So that's the picture. So, so can you tell me what it is? Like, like if I tell you like the point off the axis, like X, like uh, you, what the two dimensional representation actually is? Yeah, like, I, could, I mean, I can write it down up to equivalence. Mm -hmm. I okay. mean, I, they, I can actually give you the two two by two matrices. In fact, I did an undergraduate research project with a. A student who wrote down all these matrices. Yeah, I could tell you exactly. Okay, what okay it cool. Is. So there's like a constructive, there's like a way of from this. It sounds like that. Okay, actually, it sounds like you're saying that in general, in a much more complicated example, it's actually the information is extractable. You can algorithmically figure out what the what the what the things are, what the representation. Yeah. Are above any so point. for this for this algebra, you only have one relation, and you're working with two by two matrices. So basically, you're finding two matrices, let's say big X and big Y that satisfy this equation. You wanna check that it's irreducible. You wanna check that it's kernel or annihilator corresponds to the point that you have down here, but it is computable. When you get representations that are higher dimensional or algebras that have lots of relations, complicated relations, then it's a lot harder. So really what you're doing is you are, you know there's one there and then you just find it by brute force by simply looking yeah, at the Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. So putting this theorem, let's revisit this theorem. So we have a nice algebra, okay? We know that uh, it's PI, so we have a finite PI degree. That's gonna be the upper bound of all the dimensions of irreps. And then what we can do now is, first of all, relate the irreps to this affine variety. The affine variety defined by taking max spec of z. And even further, what we can do is use the geometry of this affine variety to help organize what the irreps are. So basically, there are two cases. You got the irreps that have maximal dimension, where you have equality here, and then you got the irreps that have lower dimension. The ones that have maximal dimension. These are gonna to correspond to the so-called Azumaya locus, okay? So whenever you hear Azumaya, 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 this corresponds to representations that have maximal dimension, just like a matrix algebra, you only got one dimension, okay? On the other hand, you can have um, representations that have lower dimension. And in this case, where's, with the Azumaya locus, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the representations and points here. Here, you could have ramifications. So like in our example above, uh, we had a two-to-one map here, two-to-one map here, but off the axis, we have one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, another interesting part about this result is that this collection of points that correspond to irreps of max dimension, this actually forms an open dense subset of the smooth locus of y. And the ones that correspond to irreps that have lower dimension, uh, it just forms a sub variety of y. Could be empty, I mean, if, if y is you know, smooth. So this is a really interesting tie between representation theory of an algebra that's close to being commutative and, and affine varieties. So let's revisit our example. Okay, so here's our picture here. In this case, our y, again, which was max spec of z, z with a polynomial ring and two variables. So y was just the plane. This is smooth. So 
In this case, we end up getting that the azumaya locus, which is all the stuff off of the diagonal, proper, is properly contained in the smooth locus here. But the case that's actually really nice is when we have equality. Because that, that will form a really tight connection between Y and your representation theory of A. Fortunately, we don't have equality here. But the point of this talk is that there are actually lots of algebras for which we do have equality. Okay, so to make this clear, it's very convenient to have that the azumai locus, in other words, all of the points in max spec of Z, so that its representations have maximal degree, that's another way of stating this, actually corresponds to the smooth part of max spec of Z. Very convenient to have this. So it sounds like, like there's some moduli space of representations living over the, the this this spec of the thing. Yes. And there's some reason, some reason why if it's Azamaya, it's like smooth. Like there's some presume. Like I, the only way I can imagine this could have been improved is there's some reason why when you deform it, it's like the deformations are unstructured or something. And then for some reason, when in your example, when you go to the axes, the irreducible two-dimensional splits into two one-dimensionals, but then mm -hmm. something crazy happens over here. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, when you have that this situation occurs, right, we could take complements. We actually have that, all right, the representations that correspond to, or the points that correspond to representations of lower dimension then correspond to the singular locus, the singular variety, right? So this, this is, you know, if you have this equality, we have satisfied our goal here. Okay, so um, just to give a, just a picture, for instance, if we have a situation where we have a PI algebra where the azumaya locus corresponds to the smooth part and the ramification locus corresponds to the singular part, this is what's gonna happen. You got your um, your y down here, okay. You got um, smooth stuff. You got singular stuff. This is my attempt to draw <laughs> singular variety. All right. So you got some some pinches. You got some folds here. And what's going to happen is when you have this equality, your singular points are going to correspond precisely to lower dimensional representations, perhaps in a finite to one fashion. And your smooth points are going to correspond to irreducible representations of maximal dimension in a one-to-one -one fashion. Okay, so this, this picture becomes crystal clear when this equality holds. Okay, and just to reiterate, this equality, it fails when we have this algebra because the singular locus is empty, but we have reps of lower dimension. This is, I mean, even though this example is Nice, it's kind of, the, it's not the interesting case geometrically. It's got like lower degree representations correspond to, well, there's no correspondence here. However, the nice situation does happen for very useful algebras, quantized enveloping algebras, quantized function algebras. And these two situations, these for these prime PI algebras, we do have this equality, this equality. All right. Now, uh, in the last, I guess, 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to explain why this situation actually holds for more algebras, namely some PI algebras. So Are there any questions we're, before we're, I continue? Mm -hmm. We're kind of flexible. So, so, we, uh, okay. so. Yeah, I'm trying to go please. slow to make sure everybody. Yeah, I'd, rather, <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather interrupt you and, and learn more than, uh, mm -hmm. uh, than have you speed. Any questions before we continue? I would ask you a question, if possible. This mm -hmm. nice picture that I see that is relating the singular locus and um, smooth locus of some fine variety. Uh, what uh, if I ask the uh, inverse question? Which uh, kind of varieties appear mm -hmm. like that for some PI algebra? I don't, I mean that, I, you know, I have examples in my head. So we're going to see examples later, but. Um, it is not known, maybe. No, no, no. 
I see. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's another, also another, like the type, hmm? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. No, 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 sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it's also the type question. of question I don't think about either. I don't think about what kind of varieties do I get. I think about what kind of algebras do I have. And <laughs> I kind of come at it from a different angle too. So. And uh, <laughs> uh, another question interesting for me is, uh, is this uh, PI algebra brings, uh, bears some information about the, singular, the singularities of uh, this uh, variety? Mm. So uh, saying in other ways, how much information does it bear? So I don't know much about the representations. So these are very naive questions, but it's very interesting. They're very hard. <laughs> they're very hard questions. Okay, the reason why the second question is so hard is because computing centers, I mean, I gave examples of centers, but in general, computing centers is very difficult. Given an, okay. an arbitrary non commutative algebra to compute its center, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And then you have to take max spec of it and then pick out the singularities. So it's, yeah, this yeah. is tough. I know, I know examples in families, but I, you know, general results. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, oh, no, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Okay. So um, let me uh, get to the elliptic algebras that were advertised in the talk. So these came about in this field called non-commutative projective algebraic geometry. Uh, these folks were really interested um, in studying non-commutative algebras that resembled polynomial algebras back in the 1980s. And by resembled, I mean theoretically, homologically, look, smell, feel like a polynomial algebra. So these algebras are now referred to as art and shelter regular algebras of dimension B. And by definition, uh, they have the same growth as a polynomial algebra, same Hilbert series, have finite global dimension, they satisfy Gorenstein condition, they're very nice. Okay. Now, what, what, if we... What, what's a, so what's an example of something we should think of like that? Is like, is the CXY? Oh, oh here it's coming. Yes, okay, so if we take a commutative Art and Shelter regular algebra, they're always polynomial algebras, okay? In fact, the only commutative AS regular algebras are polynomial algebras. Uh, some other examples of art and shelter regular algebras are these uh, skew polynomial algebras, for instance. Uh, this is one that has a uh, dimension two. Um, you have a polynomial ring in, well, the one, so they're classified up to dimension three. The ones of dimension one are just your polynomial rings in one variable. The ones of dimension two, they basically look like this, except I could have like a Q being a root of unity. Um, there's also a Jordan algebra that's similar to this. But in dimension three, the classification sort of explodes. There are several different types of families. Um, and the trickiest family that um, was studied were these ones uh, called Scalene algebras. Now, the reason why they were tricky is because usually when you like to compute, you like to have um, like a, a Grobner basis or write down a vector space basis of your algebra and, and do computations with the basis. But it's actually not impossible, but it's, it's really hard to write down the Grobner basis for Scalene algebras. You plug this in, this algebra into a computer, it's gonna run forever. <laughs> so, the way that these algebras were studied was with using geometric methods. Okay, so here's a presentation of a three-dimensional Sklein algebra. It's not really important here, but basically it is a um, algebra that is generated in three generators of degree one. They have three quadratic relations um, that also depend on three uh, parameters, A, B, and C that are generic. We're, we're gonna avoid uh, some bad points. Like you can't have ABC all equal to uh, zero, for instance. Now, the way that they're studied is you equip them with uh, certain data. I, I don't really have time to get into how to get this data, but let's just say that it goes, these algebras go hand in hand with an elliptic curve that's explicitly defined in terms of A, B, and C and an automorphism on the elliptic, elliptic curve that also depends on A, B, and C. And in fact, when uh, the origin's chosen to be one, negative one, and zero, 
this automorphism is given by translation by the point ABC, which in, indeed is a point on this elliptic curve. So can I, um, uh, let's see. The, so it, it looks like, so I've heard this phrase when in algebra before, but never knew what it meant. And now you've got a three-dimensional example there, which looks like just some crazy thing. Uh, and so it comes up. So the reason we care about these things is because it looks like polynomial under this thing, or is it because one's looking at elliptic curves and rational points and we're led somehow to construct this thing, or it comes up in nature in other ways, or where does this- oh, structure... All of the above. So okay. if we stick in one, negative one, zero, we get a polynomial ring in uh, three variables. Representations of these algebras appear in string theory. And you can also think of these algebras in a way as a deformation of a polynomial ring in three variables. Okay. Okay. But the motivation that I'm using for now is that they were interested in studying algebras that satisfied these homological properties. And these were the family that were left out. You really didn't need. Um, oh, so, 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 okay. So you're trying to classify things and you have a bunch of nice things. And then there's one extra thing that nature is telling you must also be nice. Yeah. This is that it's turned up elsewhere repeatedly, and therefore we should be paying. We should study it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one, by study it with, uh, with this geometric data, I mean that if you want to know information about this algebra, the behavior of this data is going to help you along the way. So, what do we want to know for this talk? We want to know when these algebras are PI. We want to know when they're close to being commutative. And they're always prime, by the way. I just threw that in there. But we really want to know when they're PI. What's cool is that these algebras happen to be PI if and only if this automorphism has finite order. So for example. And then somehow you take that finite order automorphism and use that to somehow cook up some universal relation some i presume yeah i uh, will it's okay. the way the proof works is we don't actually construct what the polynomial identity is but okay. we know it exists yeah well that's even, this that case, seems crazier that seems even hmm? like the only way to know something okay that's even more nuts like i would have thought okay I'll, I'll, i might maybe ask later okay in this case the pi deg degree ends up being the order of this automorphism so for example, if I take uh, ABC to be one, negative one, zero, we get a polynomial ring in three variables, all right? That's PI degree one. And remember that that is precisely the origin of this elliptic curve. So an automorphism is given by the point, um, I guess one, negative one, zero, the origin. So everything checks out. PI degree is one, order the um, automorphisms one, done in the commutative case. Okay. Now, um, as we discussed before, in order to get this game started about studying representations, we need to know the center. We have to know the center. And the center of these elliptic algebras are actually kind of hard to compute. In the case where you have a three-dimensional Scalene algebra, the center is generated by four generators of degree n or pi degree one generator of degree three, and those generators satisfy one relation of degree three n. Now, what this means is that the geometric object that we're gonna to use to study representations of our Scalene algebra, this is gonna be a hypersurface in C4. Uh, the main result now is that under all this setup, we do end up getting that the Azumaya locus corresponds to the smooth locus of this variety. So we can read off a lot of information about representations of this Scalene algebra in the PI case by looking at, well, uh, the behavior or what Y looks look like. So let me give you a picture. Okay. There are two cases. You got two cases. Um, 
So we have the case where the PI degree is co prime to three. And you have two types of representations. You have those that have maximal dimension, and you just have the trivial representation. So in this blob, I'm, I'm drawing this um, hypersurface in uh, C4, we end up getting that, uh, well, the singularity locus is just a point. It's just a point. Every other point is smooth. And because you have this nice relationship between the Azumai locus and the geometry of Y, we have these smooth points correspond to the maximal dimensions. And this one singular point corresponds to the trivial rep. That's in this nice case. We have a more interesting situation where the PI degree is divisible by three. Okay, so not only do we get irreps of maximal dimension, we also get irreps that have dimension equal to the order of sigma divided by three. And then we also have the trivial representation as well. So what's nice is that, okay, the maximal representations correspond to the smooth points as before in a one-to-one -one fashion, but the lower dimensional reps correspond to the singular locus of your variety in this case. And this the singular locus is actually gonna be the union of three uh, curves. And we're going to have a three to one map between these uh, ear reps of lower dimension with points on this curve. And so you know that because you can identify what all the ear reps are and then you can match them up or do, uh, is that right? Or not no? explicit. Yeah, we don't do anything explicitly, but we, okay. there's, yeah, it's some bounding arguments we're able to count. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, how much time do I have left? Yeah. You can, I mean, you can take up to 10 more minutes or we could just ask questions and things. Uh, you can finish whenever you want. I, 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 but you can keep on. You don't, in particular, you don't have to stop now. Okay. Um, maybe, okay. So how does this prove? I mentioned Poisson geometry. <laughs> I should right. probably, this did involve Poisson geometry. I'll explain how it, it plays a role. Okay. So this uh, variety, um, so it's a hypersurface in C4, so it's three-dimensional. But the way that we are able to get this result is that we slice up this variety in two-dimensional slices. So we take our um, generator G of our, our center, and we look at how this variety intersects with uh, the vanishing of G or the vanishing of G minus gamma, where gamma could be any scalar. So these are all two-dimensional slices. The reason why it's nice to have and, and you're telling me that I'm expecting to see the slice reach those three curves at one point each uh, as I slice yeah. it the picture. So and, over and here, all coming together at when mm -hmm. when 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 you reach uh, height zero. Like once exactly. Three. Yep. 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 So over here, there was no curves, but over here you had three points on uh, the level. I guess uh, lambda not equal to zero, but at zero you just got one one point. Okay. The reason why it's nice to have two dimensional slices is because well, then we can employ results in Poisson geometry. So in Poisson geometry, symplectic geometry, all of your varieties are even dimensional. And if you're gonna break up your variety in a way, you're only, you're only gonna have even dimensional pieces. So within a slice, you're only gonna have your two dimensional piece and maybe zero dimensional bits here and there. Along the pieces, the representations that correspond have the same dimension. So that's, that's the main point. Basically what we do is we take our variety, we break it up into these two dimensional slices. And then if we have two points on the same so-called symplectic core, that's a technical term for the piece, then these points are gonna to correspond to representations of the same dimension. So, we have our slice. I so, so I don't know whether I should ask you a question. Well, I'll, I'll ask and you can decide whether you can answer or not. So I don't know what a Poisson variety is, uh, nor do I know much symplectic geometry at all. Uh, so hence my, my question could be something along the lines of, I have no idea why the slice would have this, there's some extra structure that you happen to have, this Poisson symplectic structure that you're using. Uh, so where does it come from? What is it? Uh, 
is there, I, I don't know what's an appropriate thing to, for you yeah, to so I, I'm sweeping all of that under the rug <laughs> because it, it gets very technical, very yeah. fast. But the point right. is that what this does is it buys us, these are more, more tools that help us organize representations in terms of dimension. So it's the geometry, the but for some reason, the geometry of this moduli space of representations has this vector structure. And somehow that's telling you, some, uh, somehow the ge that geometry is telling you about the actual representations that they're parameterizing. Yes, uh, yes, a long even dimensional slice. Mm -hmm. Right, and for some, and uh, your initial, the conjecture you're proving in this case is that the singular ones are the ones that are, are are the um, non asymot that, that you can, mm -hmm. uh, or I, I guess I should say every smooth one is asymotic, but every non smooth, hence the every. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, and so somehow the geometry or the deformations of the representation are not. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so that's the upshot. We have these pictures here, and we use AG and Poisson geometry to organize irreducible representations. That's the main point. That's the main point. The geometry provides us with a framework of organizing representations by dimension. Sometimes we can write down what the representations are, sometimes we don't, but it's nice to be able to know what types of or what dimensions you do have for an algebra. Um, but, but, so, but, but does dimension three, is it dimension three is, um, the reason dimension three is here is because it's, uh, I mean, it's big enough to be complicated, but small enough, you, it's actually, I mean, it's actually tractable, but there are analogous structures in higher dimension, or is it some accident about... Uh, dimension three? Yeah, you said these are the three-dimensional, do I remember correctly that they're like, the oh. in algebras were come in different dimensions, right? And Yeah, so um, by, yeah, by dimensions really encoding the global dimension of the algebra. So oh, yeah, exactly. it's small enough to actually work with. Yeah. Um, and you, every question you have leads to <laughs> the next slide. So we have four dimensional Sclane algebras. These actually preceded the three dimensional ones. So the three dimensional ones were important in string theory. These four dimensional ones appeared in physics, uh, in the so called quantum inverse scattering method. Um, we were able to also show that the, these equations hold for these uh, Sclane algebras, for these elliptic algebras. I don't want to go into the details of what these algebras are, but they do correspond to an elliptic curve and an automorphism on it. And the, here's the picture. I'll just give you the picture, <laughs> okay? You have uh, two cases where the PI degree is odd, the singular locus of the uh, geometry that's going to control, or the, the at varieties that's going to control everything is the union of a bunch of cuspidal curves, okay? But in the case where the PI degree is even, then you got, well, a large singularity locus, you end up getting the union of two sub-varieties of dimension greater than one here. So for the four-dimensional Sclane algebras, the, the representation theory is more complicated, but we actually have a nice geometric way of encoding this information. Is it, is it symplectic, and should I, is a symplectic, uh, is there, should I, again, I'm not going to use the word symplectic too often because I'll hurt my head, but again, the symplectic story is related, is present there too, except now it's the four dimensional. Way more complicated. Uh, yeah, no. So you're we not have, slicing to get two dimensional, you're working in a four dimensional. Yeah, we have a four dimensional variety. We have to slice in very special ways because we do want even dimensional slices. Yeah, it's more complicated, way more complicated. Okay. Um, all right, so now here's the upshot. Upshot. If you're given a nice non-commutative algebra that's close to being commutative, and you happen to know what the center is, then you can get information about its representation theory by using geometric techniques. By nice, I mean prime, close to being a domain. By close to being commutative, I mean module finite over its center or PI. By knowing the center, I mean, okay, really knowing what max spec of the center is, knowing what the singularity and smooth locus are. By knowing its representation theory, we get information about dimensions of your reps. And by geometric techniques, I mean that we can organize these irreps in terms of their central annihilators, okay? Um, 
and that's it. That's that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening and um, uh, joining me in some non-commutative algebra. Thanks. <laughs> that's great. Thanks a lot. We can we can uh, unmute ourselves and thank and thank Chelsea for uh, for uh, a really educational talk.